This episode of Trifles is brought to you by the BSI Press. Manuscripts, collections of papers by international writers, and books covering a wide range of other Sherlockian topics. Find them online at bakerstreetirregulars.com. Welcome to Trifles, a weekly podcast about the Sherlock Holmes stories. It is, of course, a trifle, but there is nothing so important as trifles. Yes, Boscombe Valley was mysterious, Shoscombe Place was old, and the lodge was hysterical, but there are so many other details to pick apart in the stories. Pray, be precise as to details. You know the plots, but what about the minutia? Was Holmes more of a tea drinker or a coffee fancier? And what are all of the alcoholic drinks mentioned in the stories? You are very inquisitive, Mr. Holmes. It is my business to know what other people don't know. Scott Monty and Bert Wolder will have the answers to these questions and more in Trifles. The game's afoot. Episode 247, Sherlock Holmes, Book Collector. Well, hello and welcome to Trifles, the Sherlock Holmes podcast where we talk about the minutia in the Sherlock Holmes stories. I'm Scott Monty. I'm Bert Wolder. And boy, boy, Bert, you have a lot of books there in your collection. <laughs> I do. They seem to be stacked up. Wait, they're coming towards me. <laughs> they're coming for you. Look out. <laughs> Well, I hope we are among book lovers, uh, as our listenership would probably uh, intimate. Uh, obviously, we talk about the things in the Sherlock Holmes stories, which come from the printed page. And it is to the printed printed page that we will return in this episode. Just a few housekeeping notes in case you need them. The show notes for this episode are available at ihose.co slash trifles247, all lowercase. That'll take you to our website, which is sherlockholmespodcast.com, to the specific episode in mind. There you'll be able to find links to any of the publications or uh, topics that we're talking about where hopefully you can expand your mind as well. And you can help expand our coffers by becoming a supporter of Trifles for as little as a dollar a month. If you can afford more, hey, great. And there are even some thank you gifts associated with higher level monthly support. But what it all does is it helps us keep the electrons running over on this side. It helps us do our research and put shows together that entertain you. Well, Bert, speaking of being entertained, doesn't the doesn't the written word, the book, provide us with hours and hours of entertainment? Yeah, how about that? And and no batteries. No batteries required. And that's the beautiful thing. I don't think uh, print books are going anywhere anytime soon. It's not like uh, we, they will stop printing books in the future in in uh, favor of Kindles and other e-formats. I think we'll always appreciate having books at hand. Books make us feel uh, more intelligent. Um, maybe they actually do help us become more intelligent. And we know Sherlock Holmes relied on them quite a bit in his own uh, line of work. Uh, you recall that in episode uh, 62 of Trifles, that would have been in season two, we talked about uh, uh, reference books that Holmes had in his collection, the Whitakers, uh, Encyclopedia Britannica, and all the rest. Well, we thought in this episode we might look at some of the other books that were on the bookshelf at 221B Baker Street, the types of things that... Uh, are named in the canon, as well as, uh, well, titles that we can probably intimate were there based on the actions that Holmes took. Now, we have three uh, different references that we're working from here. Um, Bert, maybe you could help our listeners understand where we are, uh, in addition to the canon, where we are actually getting some of our uh, source material from. This subject is one that's been tackled by great Sherlockians many times over the years through, well, the 1950s and before and as recently as the current issue of the Baker Street Journal. 
But we're looking really today at three primary sources. Well, and maybe a couple of others. But one is clearly Madeline B. Stern, the great bookseller and book collector. Madeline B. Stern, who wrote a wonderful pamphlet. It's been separately printed called Sherlock Holmes' Rare Book Collector, but also appeared in the BSJ uh, in July 1953. So that would be volume three of the new series number three. And that's been reprinted for those of you who do not have the EBSJ. You fools, you fools. That's been reprinted in the Grand Game volume one. And then we're also looking in magnificent um, collection of Sherlockian scholarship, Edgar Smith's profile by Gaslight from 1944. And we're looking at a wonderful essay there called Ex Libris Sherlock Holmes. And that was written by Howard Collins. What Sherlock Holmes read and wrote is highly important for the influence it must have had upon the development and refinement of his faculties and upon his capacity to do the great deeds he did. And Howard Collins gives an appraisal of Holmes's accomplishments in the literary field. It's a lovely little study. And then the most recent issue of the Baker Street Journal, volume 71, number two, summer 2021, which just arrived at my house last week, has a terrific, really a terrific article here by Robert D. Madison called The Empty Bookshelf for the Missing Three Quartos, Reasonable Editions at a Comfortable Price. And this is... um, Yet another take on this question of Sherlock Holmes and the books that he was surrounded with and the books that influenced him. Hmm. Well, we know from the very first story, A Study in Scarlet, that uh, Holmes appreciated books. In fact, uh, he even got Watson to read from one called The Book of Life. (laughs) And uh, as Watson found out after he uh, kind of turned up his nose at the uh, presumptuous attitude of the author. Uh, it was a book written by Holmes himself, uh, which is quite an accomplishment when you think about it. He would have been all of, what, 26, 27 years old uh, right. at that point, uh, having uh, published a book. Well, probably not too dissimilar from uh, Conan Doyle, in fact, uh, starting out and getting his legs under him as an author. But w- where else can we turn in the canon to find what Holmes actually had on his shelf aside from the ego stroking volume of the book of life. (laughs) Well, as Howard Collins and Madeline Stern and Robert Madison um, all refer to in different ways, it's uh, the best place to turn is in the canon itself. But, you know, just before we do that, I'd like to point out that if I was writing a book called the book of life at, at 23, it might be very short. <laughs> <laughs> it's a pamphlet, right? Yeah. I mean, if it's my life, you know, I mean, uh, what have I got in it if I'm Sherlock Holmes? Maybe I've got, you know, the glorious Scott, <laughs> you know, the Musgrave ritual, and then, uh, I don't know, shopping lists. <laughs> well, let, let's think about it. I mean, he probably did keep scrapbooks, right? He assembled his own uh, collections of uh, crime clippings from throughout the century, as he said. Uh, his book of life, though, was not an autobiography. I don't think it was meant to be an autobiography no. uh, by any stretch of the imagination. But it was a it was a start. It was clearly in the realm of what he needed to uh, refer to as he was um, as he was beginning his career. Yeah. Well, and also as his career moved along, he tells us many times he has written monographs. And so it's not too much of a fine point to imagine that on the shelves of Baker Street, Sherlock Holmes' own monographs existed. And he says to Watson, I think in Sign of Four, uh, I've been guilty of several monographs. They're all on technical subjects. Here, for example, so clearly he's picking up a book, is one upon the distinction between the ashes of the various tobaccos. And in it, I enumerate 140 forms of cigar and cigarette with colored plates, illustrating the difference in the... Well, now, clearly, you know, this is not 
300 pages, but it's it's a significant reference work. And then another one is upon the tracing of footsteps with some remarks upon the uses of plaster of Paris as a preserver of impresses. And another one is upon the influence of a trade upon the form of the hand uh, with lithotypes of the hands of slaters, sailors, cork cutters, compositors, weavers, and diamond polishers. And in The Hound of the Baskervilles, Holmes mentions his monograph on the dating of documents. And, of course, he can look at the Baskerville manuscript at a glance and date it within 12 years. And this, you know, in addition to The Hound, this comes from The Sign of Four, The Adventure of the Copper Beaches, The Adventure of the Golden Pulse Nay, these references. In the Red-Headed League, he says, I've made a small study of tattoo marks and contributed to the literature on the subject. So all of these things are around. And, um, you know, two short monographs to the Anthropological Journal upon variations in the shape of the human ear. Now, again, in the Book of Life, now the Book of Life from a study in Scarlet is referred to as a magazine article. So it's not... No, it's not it's, an actual book yeah, itself. It's not, no. a, not a book. And it's about the science of deduction and, and analysis. Yeah. Well, um, when... Uh, Holmes is uh, conversing with Watson as they're waiting for the woman to show up to Baker Street on the claim of the ring. Uh, he said, yes, I'll probably be here in a few minutes. Open the door slightly. That will do. Now, put the key on the inside. Thank you. This is a queer old book I picked up at a stall yesterday. <laughs> De jure inter gentes, published in Latin at Liege in the Lowlands in 1642. Charles's head was still firm on his shoulders when this little brown-backed volume was struck off. Yeah. And, and Watson says, well, who is the printer? Oh, Philippe, Philippe de Croix, whoever he may have been. And on the flyleaf, in very faded ink, is written, Ex Libris Gilmy White. I wonder who William White was. Some pragmatical 17th century lawyer, I suppose. His writing <laughs> has a legal twist about it. So, Holmes, Lovely. yeah, de, de jure inter, de jure inter gentes, uh, which translates to uh, the law of man, I believe, mm -hmm. the law of men. So, um, that's yeah, interesting. Women, women need not apply, of course. Well, to, yeah, unfortunately, yeah. They, they were not admitted to the bar uh, back then. But um, William White lived from 1604 to 1678. And had, uh, according to Madeline Stern, had fathered several interesting Latin works under the pseudonym of uh, Gulimus Ferlius. I, I'm, I'm butchering that, I'm sure. Felerius. Um Holmes had indeed made a remarkable find that March day in 1881 when he returned from his wanderings uh, among the stalls in Ludgate Hill with a treasure fit to stand beside the first edition of Grotius. <laughs> Well, that's the thing. I mean, we're talking about the 19th century, the 1880s, um, and it's it's not clear the condition of this volume. I mean, clearly it was put in a stall, and it wasn't put in the stall of a vegetable salesman. It was put in the stall of a bookseller. And booksellers are informed people. You know, when you buy a book in the 1880s from a bookseller, they don't weigh it and say, okay, that'll be two and six. <laughs> you know, so he knew... He knew what it was, but also, you know, it's 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 the availability by sticking your hand out to uncover this sort of treasure. Uh, I imagine in those days there wasn't, unless it was a really great edition and good quality. I don't imagine anybody would be looking for it to, to add to add it to a library. Well, their own it, you know, prob probably not. Book, right? It wasn't on the uh, the bestseller list of the Times uh, <laughs> at, at that moment. But, um, you know, you think about how Holmes got his Stradivarius for 55 shillings in the Tottenham Court Road. Uh, yeah. you know, one wonders if he was able to strike up uh, such a deal for one of his uh, one of his books here. But see, now this is an important point. Um, here's a, here's a, a situation where Sherlock Holmes has a lot in common with Christopher Morley. Morley, as we know, is very fond of forming clubs. And one of his clubs was the Grill Partzer at in Polizei Verein. That's the Grill Partzer Morals Police. Morley, of course, had been a Rhodes Scholar, had been in Europe, had German. Could, could, you know, could read and probably speak some German. Uh, and that, and Grillpartzer, Franz Grillpartzer, was a prominent 
a playwright and writer and poet too, I think. And um, he picks up in a, a book stall and there were plenty of uh, bookshops around where he worked in Manhattan back in those days, the late 20s, early 30s. He picks up a book on his way to lunch and this becomes the record volume, you know, the 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 commonplace book of the of the three hours for lunch club and the grill parts or morals police, the grill parts that sit in Pulitz Iveron, where they write, you know, you open up the book at random, they have rituals developed from the book. But he picked up this book, this collected plays of Franz Grill Parts here for a couple of pennies and said, okay, I'll read that, and put it in his pocket. But but the point there, in addition to the fact that there's a, a, coll- a connection here between Morley and Holmes, is that it's not clear whether or not Holmes was a book collector or a book reader. Uh, It's not clear that any of these volumes, except his own that he refers to, were on his shelf a month later. You know, Mm. when he went went through this particular volume in Latin from the 17th century, what did he do with it? Maybe he passed it on. Maybe it wasn't a rare treasure to him. That's a great point. Uh, There's no indication that it uh, arises any further on down uh, the line in the canon. Uh, But there are other books that do pop up, and we'll get to them right after this quick word. In 2021, the BSI Press features three new volumes. That's right, three volumes, including one from the Manuscript Series, one from the Professions Series, and one dedicated to the outgoing head of the BSI. First, the Manuscript Series, you'll hear about the Staunton tragedy, that is, the missing three-quarter. Mike Whalen, the former head of the BSI, has edited this book, in which a number of authors take aim at the missing three-quarter. You'll learn about rugby, you'll learn about the mystery, you'll learn about, well, many things in the latest Manuscript Series. And in the latest profession series, Michael Quigley and Marsha Pollock edit this volume that brings together corporals, colonels, and commissionaires as they look at military in the canon. And the third volume is A Quiet Air of Mastery, essays in honor of Mike Whalen as he steps down as the head of the Baker Street Irregulars. And that's edited by Les Klinger. All of these and more are available at BakerStreetIrregulars.com under the BSI Press section. Be sure to pick up your copy today. All right, we're back and we're roaming the shelves at Baker Street to see what Sherlock Holmes has uh, for us. Well, in addition to some of those other uh, old tomes we've been talking about, we... um, we come across um, Winwood Reads The Martyrdom of Man. Uh, this is, gosh, I forget where this one was mentioned. It was in A Sign of Four. Sign Let of me four. recommend this book, yes. one of the most remarkable ever penned. Yes, I love that line. Um, now, I have a copy of Winwood Reads Martyrdom of Man. Do you really? And I do. And. Um, Amazingly, over the years, I don't recall ever reading it completely. <laughs> uh, you and Holmes both, probably. <laughs> you know, it, it may have been but that. See, he... Yeah, no, but see, that's another that's another good point. Me, me and Holmes both. Holmes, though, had an encyclopedic memory. Watson tells us occasionally he had, you know, a deep and detailed knowledge of every sensational crime over the. So clearly, Holmes was one who could, in in a very similar way to the way Mark Gatiss and and Stephen Moffat dramatized Charles Augustus Milverton as a criminal blackmailer with a prodigious memory and a prodigious ability to recall, Holmes would store this information in his brain attic to the exclusion of other things and then bring it back. So it's not clear. He he hung on. It, it, he was probably very happy to give this book to Watson, <laughs> thinking that it would soon be out of Baker Street and there'd be because there was no double shelving in Baker <laughs> Street. <laughs> well, you'll recall that in his retiring years, uh, Holmes had trouble figuring out the uh, the culprit in the lion's mane. 
You know, he, he heard the dying man say, uh, Cyanea, Cyanea, and he couldn't quite place it. And lo and behold, he got back, uh, he got back home to a silver and chocolate volume uh, and pulled out John George Wood's Out of Doors, the Reverend John, John George Wood. Um, and that's where he found the reference to Cyanea Capillata and, uh, and the picture in it, which uh, brought it back to his mind. So, so much for uh, having a, uh, an encyclopedic knowledge at that point, or a photographic memory at that point. Yes, his recall was uh, get it, beginning to trouble him, clearly. Yeah. Now, Holmes actually posed as an old bookseller in The Empty House. It's how he managed to get Watson's attention in a surprising way uh, when they were first reunited. And he identified the gap on the second shelf, and, and then he named a few books that he was carrying around. Now, what, what were some of those titles? Well, it was a wonderful collection. He mentions um, one book. and no, Watson picks up a book, and one of them is called The Origin of Tree Worship. And then Holmes, who's still in his disguise, mentions uh, that's when they bump into each other on the street. And then when Holmes is, is face-to-face with Watson in disguise, he mentions three more titles that he's carrying, British Birds, Catullus, and The Holy War. And he says to Watson, you know, I run a little bookshop at the corner of Church Street in Kensington. Hmm. Now, why anyone would be walking around London <laughs> with, you know, maybe I'll bump into this. I think today I'd really like to sell my Catullus and the Holy War and this book on British birds. I'm sure I'm going to bump into exactly the right person. <laughs> Well, you know, maybe uh, Neville Sinclair was back on the street and looking for some kind of quotable, uh, having run out of Wordsworth and Shakespeare at the street corner. You know, why not quote in Latin, in the original Latin, uh, quote Catullus at people? But see, now, interestingly enough, these are props Holmes has acquired for his disguise. Mm. So one would think that because they are props he acquired for a disguise, that he did not devote any particular... Uh, thought to what he would acquire. Uh, it could be that he just picked them up for a few shillings from a bookshop he passed on his own, which is more than likely. And it's not likely that he ever had any desire to open them or read them or keep them or do anything. Yeah, I'm, that's a really good point, Bert. I mean, these were props at best. I mean, if he actually, <laughs> if he actually got someone who was interested in making a purchase from him, well, then then the jig is up at that point. <laughs> Suddenly, the the old stooped over uh, crouched man uh, pops up and hurls his books away and runs down the pavement. Um, but yeah, he would not have had to get uh, particularly uh, valuable volumes to carry around in this instance. They 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 could have actually only been the boards. Perhaps there was nothing in them, right? <laughs> uh, maybe maybe there was a carve out in one of them to carry a pistol. I mean, who knows? Oh, who that's knows? Very, that's very clever. I like that. Yeah. yeah. Um, so so anyway, those are some of the the volumes. And of course, later on in his uh, career, Holmes uh, penned another volume, uh, more than a monograph. This was uh, a pretty significant work: uh, the um, Practical Handbook of Bee Culture. Uh, with uh, some observations upon segregation of the queen. That was really, uh, in as much as the Book of Life was his introduction to the literary world, this was really uh, probably his, uh, his ultimate um, uh, volume. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, it's, and a then- shame that, it's a shame that the German spy von Bork didn't have enough time to really study it. He might have enjoyed it. <laughs> he was too busy looking at pigeonholes, I think. <laughs> well, I'm sure we could wax poetic on other books that uh, may or may not have graced the shelves of 221B Baker Street. This hopefully gave you a taste for some of them. And after all, it is just a trifle. It is, of course, a trifle, but there is nothing so important as trifles. Please join us again next week for another installment of Trifles. Show notes are available on SherlockHolmesPodcast.com. Please subscribe to us on Apple Podcasts and be sure to check out our longer show, I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere, where we interview notable Sherlockians and share news of the Sherlockian world. 
You've taken my breath away, Mr. Holmes. I meant no harm by it, and I'm much obliged to him for helping me pick up my book. You make too much of a trifle, sir. You should have spared yourself the journey. Now, oh, if you'll excuse oh, me. Oh, no great journey, sir. I am a neighbor of yours. You will find my little bookshop on the corner of Church Street. May I sit down? Ah, I'm very happy to see you. I'm sure, Doctor. Perhaps you collect? 